So this is week four, week four of the Him and Her series. If you've been with us week one, we look at marriage. Oh, the Lord is speaking. Week two, we looked at singleness. We followed that last week uh, with dating. This week is sex. Yes. <laughs> Now, the fact that I can set the word sex is making some of you uncomfortable, and if you're uncomfortable, well, join the crowd, all right? This is going to be an, an interesting kind of, of sermon. We're going to dig into God's Word, and we'll try to make this microphone work. If it doesn't, we might have to just switch things up, but uh, it might be interesting that you're thinking, why are we spending a week for a sermon talking about to be honest, I wish we had a series because one sermon is not enough. Now, for many of us in our culture and in the things around us, we see that sex is, is, is great, it's whatever, do what you want, it's between you and whatever, whoever, and trying to say that maybe there are some ways sex should be done, in some ways it shouldn't, um, it, it's not really okay to say that. Now, if that were the case, we wouldn't need a sermon. We wouldn't need to come and talk about sex and, and what God's plan is and where did it even come from. But as we study God's Word, and, and to be honest, the sex and, and issues of sex are in almost, almost every book of the Bible. It's throughout the Bible. We're going to look at, at a few places, and we're going to absolutely see that sex within marriage is God's plan. Sex within marriage is God's plan, and so that's what we want to look at today. Now, some of you, at least one person I heard, is excited to hear this message, okay? We need to hear this message. Others of you really are, are probably kind of nervous, and you're a little afraid of what I might say, and I might go somewhere that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. And if we're honest, there's some of us here hoping that I don't look at you, that I don't look you in the eyes, because maybe I'm going to know that secret sexual sin that you have going on. To be honest, all of us have struggles in this area. So when I look at you, I'm not calling you out, but in a way I am calling you out because every single one of us, we've believed lies about sex. We've allowed the culture to tell us what sex is and what it isn't. It's time that we replace those lies with God's Word. So some of you are here and you say, I, you know, I'm, I'm married and, and, and my spouse and I, our sex life is pretty good. And if that's you, that's awesome. But I know that for some of us who are married, maybe, maybe sex is one of the areas of the greatest frustration in your marriage. Some of you, some of you got married and you'd never talked about sex or you started having sex during your time of dating and now you're married and still it just... It feels wrong or shameful. You and your spouse just aren't thinking the same thing. You're on different pages. Well, that's okay. We can restart today as we look at God's Word. Others here, you're not married, and, and you're thinking, I'm doing some stuff that I know I shouldn't, and I kind of hope Mark doesn't say it, but you know, again, you all know what you're doing. Lord? That does sound like a thunderstorm, doesn't it? I'm going to change the mic if I have to, but I move a lot, so I like this one. I need to move forward. If you want me to move forward, I'm fine coming all the way up here. Yago's not going to like it, but I'm good. All right, we're going to play with this for a bit, and maybe God is speaking in this thunder saying, hey, wake up. You need to hear this message. You need to hear what's going on, okay? So some of us, some of us were not married. And the things we're thinking, the things we're, we're looking at on our phones, the way we're interacting with others around us, we know 
We know it's not godly. We know there are problems. Switch. It helps if it's turned on. All right, we're going to give this one a shot. There you go, Shashi. Some of us, we know that we are doing things we shouldn't. Okay. And I am going to tell you at the end, it needs to stop. As we look at God's word, we've got a choice. We can ignore it or we can say, okay, God, this is your truth. <laughs> I need your strength to move forward. But as we talk about sex, I also know that some of you here are victims. You've been hurt. Some of you have been used. Others have used you, your body, to try to get some type of sexual pleasure. And I just want to say I'm sorry. God loves you. It was so much easier going through this in front of my computer than looking at you because I know, I know the brokenness in this country. I know the brokenness in the church. If that's you, if you have been abused, God loves you desperately. He created you for his glory. Do not allow someone else to define who you are. If you've been hurt, please talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Don't keep carrying that secret shame. Some of us here, we have used others for our own benefits, whether that's in person or whether that's through po pornography. And again, we're going to see in God's word this needs to stop. The call for every one of us at the end is going to be the same. It's going to be a call to repentance. I'm telling you where we're going right now. We're going to look at God's word and hopefully we'll get there and you'll see You'll see what God's word says. But I want you to be preparing right now. I don't want you pushing those thoughts out of your mind. I don't want you sitting there thinking, I hope Mark is not going to touch on my problem. Because to be honest, if I don't touch on your problem, if I don't touch on your sin, guess what? God knows what it is. I don't need to know. My prayer, as I've been... <laughs> Wow, in the, in the month or six weeks or whatever since uh, Sheshi asked me to do this message, my prayer has been that we would find healing and freedom. And I know that there's nothing I can do in 30 minutes to make that happen, but God's word hitting your heart and the power of the Holy Spirit, I do believe that some of us are going to walk out of here different people at the end of today. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to see what God's word says about sex? Okay, and again, if you're uncomfortable, I, I guarantee you, I've never used the words sex and nakedness or naked as much in 30 minutes as I'm going to do right here, okay? But it's in God's word. This isn't coming from me, it's from God, so you can blame him if you don't like it, all right? So where are we going to go? Well, let's go to the beginning. Let's start in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at how we were created, and we're going to look at sex. And yeah, sex is in the very first chapter of the Bible. You may think, well, I've read it, I don't see it. Yeah, we're going to find it. Now again, for most of us, whether we're be whether be believers following Jesus Christ or someone just brought us to church and we don't really know what's going on, most of us, we kind of fall into one of three categories when we think about sex. First, we think, hey, sex is physical. God gave me these parts. God gave me these desires. God made those other people look so good. I mean, it's just, it's just physical. It's just the way it is. We're animals. We've got needs. We need to satisfy our needs. And we're going to see that that's not God's truth. Some of us think that sex was created for pleasure. And it, since sex is created for pleasure, and it's really no big deal, we should go and get it. Okay? Sex is pleasurable. And I do believe that God created sex to be pleasurable. Yes, I just said that. Okay? But that is not the focus of sex. 
And we're going to see that that is a lie and an incomplete picture that, that sex is just for pleasure. Other of us think sex is dirty, and if it wasn't for the fact that maybe, you know, we want to have kids, yeah, if we could just get rid of the whole sex thing, it might make the world a better place, right? But again, we're going to see that that is not biblical. So where do we start? We start with God, and we start at creation. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, you're looking up here looking for the Bible verses, right? Guess what? You're not going to find them. Okay? When you're at home, nobody's going to be projecting Bible verses on your wall for you. Okay? So, you've got your Bible, open your Bible. If, if you've got your Bible app and you can avoid Facebook or whatever, go ahead and pull out your phone and, and pull out the Bible. We're going to be looking at several passages in Genesis and 1 Corinthians today, starting here in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness, okay, so that they can rule over the world. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. So in the very first chapter of the Bible, we see that God created male and female. What does it mean to be male and female? Well, males and females have different parts. Males and females have different hormones. Okay, this is a biology class. Where'd Frank Sanchez go? He's out with the youth, okay? God created males and females. And then did you see what is the very first command that we read in the Bible? The first command to humans is this. Be fruitful and increase in number. Be fruitful and multiply. Let me just ask a question. How do we do that? How do we as humans multiply? Okay, it is possible that God intended babies to fall out of the sky. Okay? But if that was the case, there would be no need for male and female. Why did God create male and female? He created male and female so that humans could be fruitful and increase in number. There's no way to multiply as a species without sex. The first time we see God commanding humans, he's telling humans to have sex. Surprised at that? I was surprised at that. I've heard, I've heard some people say, well, you know, male and female, Adam and Eve, they were created, but, uh, you know, sex didn't happen until after the fall. Have you heard that? Because of the fall, because of sin, Sex came from that. Now, this is a warped view that comes out of an understanding that sex is sinful or sex is dirty. Again, there's no reason for God to create male and female if he did not intend for them to have sex. There's no reason. Again, if babies are falling out of the sky or growing on trees, why not just have one kind of us? Why do we need two different kinds? In verse 31, if you go a little further in that chapter, at the end of the chapter, it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. He saw man and woman, Adam and Eve, naked and different and very good. Now, in chapter 2 of Genesis, we see uh, a, a kind of a more focused retelling of a part of the creation, specifically about creating man and women. So, staying here at the beginning of Genesis, looking in chapter 2. Chapter 2, at the end of verse 20, okay? God had created Adam. God had created man. And man was alone. Animals, they had partners. Man did not yet have a partner. It says at the end of verse 20 in chapter 2, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the, man, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. 
And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So again, the very first message when Sheshi preached, we talked about marriage, and again, it was, it was God's intention that man and woman, husband and wife, two equal partners would come together in a marriage. Yes, two equal partners. Now we also saw they have different roles, but, but man and woman coming together, leaving the father, the mother, leaving the, the, the parents, okay, being united with one another, and becoming one flesh. In a marriage, you have two people and they create a new thing. They create a marriage. They create a family. They create one thing, one flesh. One of, that, one of the expressions of that one flesh reality is sex. And we're going to see more, but sex is part of that coming together as one flesh. Now, Again, one of the most powerful worldview, just mind-blowing statements that I think in the entire Bible is that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That's how it was supposed to be. That's how it was supposed to be between a husband and a wife. No shame. Enjoying one another. Okay? The Bible says it. Song of Solomon tells wives to enjoy their husbands' naked bodies and tells husbands to enjoy their wives' naked bodies. Okay, I'm just not, I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. Okay? So this was the way God intended a husband and a wife together naked with no shame. Now, some of you say, may say, well, yeah, but, you know, sex was, was just supposed to be for making babies, and it really, you know, wasn't this, this big a deal, and I'm not sure God necessarily needs us or wants us to have sex. The Bible said, be fruitful and multiply. We got our kids. Can we be done? Is sex even needed? Or maybe sex is sinful if we're not trying to have kids. Well, the Bible says, hey, husbands and wives, have sex. Do you know the Bible says that? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians. And I know we're moving a lot here, but uh, two weeks ago, I think, Jeremy preached. And, and he preached in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about, about singleness and the value of singleness. But the... All right, here we go. A few verses before where Jeremy was preaching from a couple weeks ago, we learn a bit about husbands and wives and sex. So again, if you're with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, starting in verse 1, now for the matters you wrote about. Paul's responding to the Corinthians and some questions they had. Now to the matters you wrote about. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Depending on your translation, there may be some Bible quotes there. I think Paul is responding to something that they were saying. It's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But then Paul says, since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Now, if you've ever studied the letter to the Corinthians, this letter, you understand that Corinth, I mean, Corinth was messed up. This city was an absolute mess, was an absolute mess. Sexual sin was rampant. 
Sometime before, before the time of, of, of the early church. Actually, the temple of Aphrodite had 1,000 temple prostitutes. In a city of about 60,000, there were 1,000 prostitutes serving in worship at the temple of Aphrodite. By the time the early church came along, that number had, had gone down, but still, the idea that, that sex was a physical act and it was just physical, that was common. In fact, the, the view, the, the view was that you've got a spirit and you've got a body. And really, the only thing that matters is the spirit or the spiritual side of you. So what happens with the body doesn't matter. And two things happened because of this view. Some people said, because the body doesn't matter, we can only work on feeding the spirit. Therefore, any kind of pleasure, any kind of pleasure that comes, we need to ignore it and push it away. That's what's happening here in chapter 7. We're going to see the other problem in, in, in a bit in chapter 6. We're, yeah, we're going to go backwards. In chapter 6, we're going to see that some people said, again, because the spirit matters and the body doesn't matter, then you can do whatever you want with the body. So the idea, again, of having sex with temple prostitutes, hey, my spirit is for the Lord. My body is just on earth. It doesn't really matter. Okay? And we're going to see Paul addressing both of these issues. So again, the first issue here, the first issue here is that some people said a man should not have sexual relations with a woman. And it was actually happening in marriage. That husbands and wives were saying, we want to be spiritual. We want to be holy. Therefore, we won't have sex. <laughs> and what did Paul say? Um, hello? That's, that's pretty stupid. Why? Because sexual immorality. God made us as sexual creatures. God did not intend for a husband and wife to not have sex together. It does say maybe there's a time you come together for prayer. Or, but basically, what is Paul saying? Husbands have sex with their wives. Wives have sex with your husbands. Okay? That's what it's saying. Verse 4 is absolutely radical here. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her hu husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. In that culture, the husband was considered the boss. He was the owner of his wife. Now in the church day, we've never had anyone with that kind of attitude, right? Some of you are laughing. Some of you know that that's not true. In our work with, with Tanzanian pastors and, and pastors from throughout East Africa, many of them have said, even, I mean, in the church, even for us pastors, what we have been taught is that the husband is the boss, the wife's body belongs to him, and he can do whatever he wants, whenever she wants, whenever he wants, whatever, whenever he wants, and she has to submit. Hey, Ephesians 5, wives submit to your husbands. Therefore, a woman needs to do what I want. That's the attitude. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that the husband and the wife yield to one another. They give to one another. And if you've read 1 Corinthians, have you gone all the way to chapter 13? What do we read in chapter 13? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not dishonor. Love always protects. We saw in week one, again, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. If we're going to do that, if we're going to do that, it has to happen in the bedroom as well. Husbands protecting, honoring their wives. This equality in marriage, again, it was a different kind of thing. It was not expected. Paul was as he was sharing God's plan, God's plan, that sex is for marriage. Okay? This is radical stuff. And unfortunately still today, we've got this messed up. We don't truly 
understand it. But as we read this passage, I think, again, it's pretty clear. Sex is for marriage and marriage only. Okay, well, how do we see that? Well, in verse 2, since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his wife. What is the answer to sexual sin? It's marriage and sex the way God intended it to be. Husbands, you may have sex with your wife and no one else. Wife, wives, you may have sex with your husband and no one else. Some of you are thinking, I don't have a husband and wife. Or, not and. I don't have a husband or a wife. That's what the Bible says. I'm not here to be harsh. I'm not here to condemn. But I am here to say that the Bible makes it clear that sex is to happen between a husband and a wife. In loving, yielding, that yielded relationship, giving to one another. So, sex should happen only within a marriage. And again, just the, the affirmation that sex, it's a good thing. Husbands and wives are supposed to be having sex. Unfortunately, as we look at the world around us, as we look in our own lives, we see so much brokenness in this area. It would be great if every husband and wife had a, had a fulfilling, happy, sexual relationship with one another and everyone else was trusting God's timing, trusting God's plan. But again, it's not what the world says. What the world says is, hey, go for it. Do whatever you want. Or the world, some in the world might say, hey, it's a horrible thing. We need to reject it. We need to push it away. There's so much brokenness in the area of sin, in the area of, of sex. And, and how did that happen? Happened with sin. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. I wanted to show you first that it was God's intention that husbands and wives even today are supposed to be having sex together. But again, how did this thing just get so messed up? Things were great. Again, at the end of chapter 2 in Genesis, what did it say? Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt what? No shame. They felt no shame. The Hebrew word here for shame, it actually means it's connected with being exploited. Being used for someone else's advantage. There's also just the idea of evil. Okay? The way God intended it to be for a husband and wife that there is freedom. There is freedom within a marriage that husband and wife can be naked together, loving one another, and there's, there, there's no problems there. There's no fear. There's no selfishness. There's no anger at, at unmet expectations or these other things. That was the way God accepted it or um, created it to be. Total acceptance within the marriage. But then if you've read Genesis chapter 3, you've heard about the fall. Adam and Eve are hanging out, interacting with Satan, which generally is not a good idea. Okay. If you feel you need to do battle with Satan, get God into, into that. Let God handle that. You talk to God. You don't need to be talking to Satan. Okay? Talk to God. He is the one who will fight for you. Okay? But Adam and Eve, they were talking to the serpent, listening to the serpent. The serpent is saying, hey, God's plan is not best. God's plan is not best. And if you want to go back, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. But in verse 6, it says, again, looking at this fruit, what is the fruit? What is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That's a great question for another sermon sometime. Okay? But let's just look at what happened with Adam and Eve. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. 
She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Hey, men, don't blame women for the fall. Adam was standing right there with his mouth shut. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now this is fascinating. This is absolutely fascinating. At that moment, what happened? Look in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So when did all of this stuff get messed up around sin? It happened at the, I mean around sex. It happened at the moment of the fall, the moment of sin. We have brokenness. Again, this was Adam and Eve. This was husband and wife. Supposed to be naked and without shame. But instantly they realized that they were naked. And they felt shame. We don't have time to go too deeply into that. But I do want to read this great quote from John Piper. The simple open nakedness of innocence now feels inconsistent with the guilty person that I am. I feel ashamed. Let me read that one more time, okay? Think of this. This is what Adam and Eve were feeling at that moment. The simple, open nakedness of innocence now feels inconsistent with the guilty person that I am. I feel ashamed. So why do we have these issues? Why is sex such a mess, both inside our marriages and outside of our marriages? Why is that? It's because of sin. Because now we're messed up. We're messed up. And I am going to feel nervous with my spouse because I realize, oh, maybe my body's not perfect. Or my spouse, I'm going to look at my spouse and think, oh, well, in pornography I've seen other bodies looking different and, and my spouse doesn't look like that. Okay. All of this stuff has absolutely come into this thing that is supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be godly. It is supposed to be holy. Husband and wife together in the bedroom, together with God. It's a holy thing. Sex within marriage is God's plan. But then sin just messed it all up. Sin messed it all up. Now Tim Keller says that sex is the covenant renewal service. Sex is the covenant renewal service. What does that mean? That means when a husband and a wife lovingly have sex, I'm saying lovingly because sometimes it's not. When a husband and wife are together lovingly having sex, what they're saying is, I again affirm that I have chosen you and you only for the rest of my life. There will be no other. That's what sex is in a marriage. It's the covenant renewal service. I am telling you again that I am committed to you for the rest of my life, to you and no other. Friends, let us not use sex to say anything less than that. Now, I could take you to so many passages in the Bible that, that talk about the, the brokenness and the, the, the results of sexual sin. But let's just, go back to, let's just go back to 1 Corinthians, our last passage here. And I know I'm running out of time, but this is too good. We, we got to know what God's, we've got to know what God's saying in this thing, okay? Turn with me to chapter 6. So just... Those verses just before what we just read, and if you don't have your Bible with us, if you're, if you're taking notes and you want to go back and look, we're, we're now in chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Let me, let me read this. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. 
but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitutes? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirits. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So again, what were the Corinthians saying? Hey, the body and the spirit, they're separate. Just the same way that we eat when we're hungry, we have sex when we have sexual desires. It's just in the body. And, and what did Paul say? No. No. <laughs> yes, you have those body parts. And yes, you have those sexual urges. But they are not somehow outside of you. They are not somehow separated from your spirit. That's your body. And your body will be raised at the resurrection. Your body matters to God. What we do with our bodies matters to God. Your body is important. What we do matters. It's fascinating to me that Paul connects sexual sin with all three members of the Trinity. If you saw that, that's awesome. I never saw that, and I read this so many times. But look at this. In verse 14, it says, By his power, God, that's God the Father, raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also. So the Father, in the same way that he raises the Son, he's going to raise us. What else? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? We see, we see that the Son is also here in this passage. We are connected to Christ himself. In verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Now, what is the Trinity? And I realize many of us have a very difficult time understanding Trinity. But here it is. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They are three separate persons. Three separate persons and one God. How does that work? Sheshi, here's another sermon for us at some point, okay? But that's the way it is. If you want to talk about it, hey, I love theology. Let's talk, okay? Our sexual sin impacts our relationship with the Father, our relationship with the Son, and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. That is a mind-blowing truth. When we sin sexually, it's not just, hey, you know what? It's my body. No. There are major, major implications. God created sex. And sex within marriage is his plan. Sex within marriage is God's plan. Now, I know we have only looked at a few passages. And if you still are unsure, if you think that maybe there's a loophole for whatever it is that you want to do or that you have been doing, I encourage you, to read the scriptures. I was going to say, have you Google it, but I'm afraid of what you might find. It might be better to come talk to one of the elders, talk to one of the leaders in the church. Okay? We would love to talk to you and say, hey, you know what? I'm engaged, and we've been having sex. We're going to be married. Is that a problem? Well, let's talk about that. But what does the Bible say? Sex within marriage is God's plan. Again, husbands, you may have sex with who? Your wife, that's it. Wives, you may have sex with who? Your husband, that's it. If you don't have a husband or wife, who can you have sex with? No one. And this is whether you're physically present or it's happening through pornography. This is not okay. 
when it says here, there's something different with sexual sins. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Sexual sin has far deeper consequences than we can imagine. So here we are. We've looked at God's Word, and, and we've seen these truths. And again, I, I want to encourage you on a few things. First of all, if you've been believing a lie, if there's something about sex, something about marriage, some way that you've been listening to the culture, instead of studying God's Word, today's the day that you can begin changing that mindset. Pray, repent, repent of those false beliefs and say, God, give me a mind that believes your truth. Second, if you're married, you may realize that some of the ways that you've interacted with your spouse or some of the things you've done outside of your marriage, these are not honoring God. The call to you is the same. It begins with repentance. I know that adultery is happening in the church. I know that pornography is happening in the church. And these are happening in Christian marriages. Friends, flee sexual immorality. It has to stop. It has to stop. Today can be a day where you begin to find freedom in this area. Now the road, walking out of sex addiction, walking out of an addiction to pornography, it's not easy. I'm not going to lie and tell you if you just pray, God, God, I don't want to look at pornography anymore that the urges are going to go away. Talk to somebody, okay? Come to one of the leaders. If you've got a spiritually mature friend, talk to them. We can have freedom. I love, we don't need to turn there in chapter 6 a little earlier when, when Paul is saying sexual idolaters and all these people sinning he says, hey, that is what some of you were. That is what some of you were. Some of you today are involved in sexual sin. You can be somebody who was involved in that sin. You can find freedom. The battle can be great, but people do win the battle. You can win the battle, not on your own. But through the power of the Holy Spirit and in loving community, you can do it. Talk to somebody. Don't walk out of here keeping that sin hidden. And some of you, you might not know Jesus Christ. And you're thinking, seriously? I thought, like, all you Christians were, like, perfect and whatever. Okay. If you've been around us long enough, you know we're not perfect. We are just as messed up as you. So what's the purpose then? If you don't know Christ, why would I even want to come to Christ if, if the problems, the things that I'm doing now, well, it's not even a problem now. Because if I'm not a believer, who cares what God says? I can just go have sex. Okay. This is a bit simplistic, but let me just tell you, it's worth it. A relationship with God is worth it. Yeah, there's the whole eternal thing, heaven and hell, and yeah, those are pretty big, but it's worth it. Allowing God to come in and transform you so that the things you want start to become the things that God wants. It's a pretty amazing experience, but again, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say, come to Jesus Christ today, and all your problems will be taken away. But I will tell you this. If you come to Jesus Christ today, the Bible says that God will come into you. The Holy Spirit of God, one of the persons of the Trinity, He will come into you and He can empower you to live a different life.